just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Him, everyone who believes in Him, will have eternal life. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that everyone who believes in Him won't perish but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Maundy Thursday. Mondatum. Mandate. Command command to do what though? What is this new command that Jesus has given? What does Maundy Thursday have to do with this? Is it a, is it a command to, to share communion? Is it a command to wash feet? Is it a command to do an act or ritual of any kind? No, it is a command to love. It is a command to agape. To love as Christ loves us. And in this love, we will discover. In fact, the world will discover that Jesus is who he says he is. And that the world will know that we are his disciples if we love one another. This is the mandate. This is the mandatum. This is the mandi of the Thursday. This is the new command. And yet we do connect this evening with Passover. The, the scriptures, the gospels offer differing uh, uh, accounts. Matthew, Mark, and Luke offer us an insight of what Jesus said and did on that night. How he took a, a bread and how he took a cup and how he broke it and poured it and gave thanks. And how that was uh, a new covenant that was being established by Jesus through his body and through his blood. John, in his gospel, does something interesting. John lets us know what they were talking about when this was happening. John lets us hear the whispering at the table. And the gospel reading that we have this evening is the John gospel reading. Now, last year when we met together for this commandment Thursday, I mentioned a word that I want to revisit because many of you asked me later, what was that word you were saying? It's the idea of afikamen, A-F-I-K-O-M-E-N, afikamen. No, I'm not cursing. No, I'm not saying something off color. The afikamen is a wafer that at the beginning of a feast, of the Passover feast, is taken out of the three and hidden. So that at the very end, when there is a, a time for dessert or the last thing that's going to be eaten, that piece of bread is going to be found and it's going to be consumed. And so in this meal that we see in John is a meal where they were just literally reclining around a table. Imagined Six of them on this side and six on the other and Jesus. And they're all resting and leaning in close to one another. Talking to one another. Whispering to one another. And Jesus is right there in their face talking to them. And in this meal, if we take the Gospels, all of them together, we have them sharing this meal and Jesus then grabs this afikamen, this dessert, this last piece of bread, and then he breaks it. But there's a conversation going on that I want to bring us into. A conversation in John 13 that helps us see the beauty of this moment and the brokenness in this moment. So let's hear John. Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. 
The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table and he took off his robes. He picked up a linen towel. He tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will understand later. No, no, Peter said. You will never wash my feet, Lord. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only wash my feet, but wash my hands and wash my heart. Jesus responded, those who have bathed need only to have their feet washed because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him. And that's why I said, not every one of you is clean. After he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes and returned to his place at the table. And he said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher. And you call me Lord. And you speak correctly. Because I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash, wash each other's feet. I have given you an example. Just as I have done, you must do. Hear that again. I have given you an example. And just as I have done, you must do. I assure you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are those who are sent greater than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you'll be happy if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in Him. If God has been glorified in Him, God will also glorify the Son of Man in Himself, and He will glorify Him immediately. Little children, I'm with you for a little while longer. You will look for me. But just as I told the religious leaders, I will also tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new command. I give you a new command. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, when you love each other. Somewhere in between this conversation, somewhere in between Jesus sharing the plate, the meal, whether it's with the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're sharing a Passover meal, or whether it's a meal before, ultimately it doesn't matter what meal it was. What ha what's important for us to know is what's happening and that Jesus is using a basin of water. He's wrapping a towel around his waist and he's using the symbol of washing feet. And he's teaching through it. And then he comes to a table. And he's trying to show them what love really is. And he shares with them words of institution. Creating a new covenant of body and blood and these symbols that we've been given to remind us of that covenant of love. He's telling us that there's a cross coming. He's been telling his disciples it's coming and that they don't want it, but it's coming too. But in this gospel reading, we're hearing really what love is. Jesus is love. What kind of love is it that God would send his only son 
to that. That God would send himself in a child for that. And to get on his knees and wash feet. And to shed his blood and to break his body. This is love on Monday, Thursday. The mandate Thursday. Love means serving with humility. Love means that no matter where we go and no matter what we do, love means getting on our knees, taking water, and washing the dirtiest parts of one another, going into a dirty world and washing them clean with the gospel. But let's not avoid the riskiest part of this. Jesus is talking to his disciples right now. And we know that God does love the whole world, that he gave his only son. But Jesus is now gathered around those who claim his name, who are following with him. And he says that love means serving in humility. That's what love means. That's what my love means, Jesus says. This is the love I know from my Father. I trust Him enough that I'm willing to get on my knees as a servant and wash your very feet. This is His love. Love means following His example. Jesus is very clear to us in this gospel reading. You are no better than your teacher. And if your teacher shows you how to wash feet, do it too. If your teacher and your Lord is willing to do that, you do it too. Follow his example. Love means serving in humility. Love means following his example. Love means happiness when we do what he had commanded us. Love means happiness when we do what he commanded Since you know these things, Jesus said, since you hear me teach these, since you've seen it in my life, you will be happy if you do them. Love means happiness, but it means happiness in doing what our master did and showed and taught. Love means loving as he loved. We've discussed this many times in this church specifically, and I want to make sure I'm emphatic and and, and we are heard in this message, that you hear this message. Love means loving as he loved us. We know love only through his love. Love not in some sentimental way, not love in some modern sexual way but it's love as he loved us for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life this is how we know love through him this is how we know love this is how you know love the love that we see in Christ and God's work of reconciliation in Christ, you being included in Christ. Love means that it starts with one another. Love means that we start loving first one another. Hear it again. The world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Yes, we are to love and serve those in the world. Yes, we absolutely need to go and bring the gospel to them. Hear hear this message clearly, Crossgates. Hear this message clearly, you who are participating tonight. We have to love each other. We have to love each other first. And until that love has been made perfect in us, there is no gospel, there's no good news to go and share the world. Love means it starts with each other. And that is why even though this room has been empty of you for so long, 
Reconciliation is still the absolute centrality of the gospel message. Love and reconciliation and service is this basin of water in which we servantly, on our knees, serve one another because Jesus did. Love means taking up our own cross and following him to his cross and being in him, in his cross Because that's who he is, but that's what love is, this new command that he gives us on this Monday, Thursday. But there is something about this right here. There's something special about this. Jesus gave a new command to love in his new covenant, and it's the new covenant that we understand in the Passover symbol. How God saves us. It's all God's work. It's God's gracious gift. There is no offering that we make. We respond and we receive because the Lord has offered this plate and this cup and continues to offer to us when we are together. Paul says to his friends in Corinth, Y'all remember that messed up church that we talked about? The one that's a giant mess. The one that fights over everything. Paul says this. I received a tradition from the Lord, which I also handed on to you. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He did the same thing with the cup after they had finished eating. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, he said. Every time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast and proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. This is a gospel proclamation here. But you'll notice, if you haven't already, that everything is empty right now. There is no water here for washing feet. There is no bread. And there is no wine. But that does not mean that God's presence and Jesus' work among us is not present. Earlier this week, I listened to something that Bishop Swanson prepared and sent out. And he talked about some prisoners of war. Or maybe they were prisoners because of their faith. And they were sitting there in the jail cells. And they didn't have any bread. And they didn't have any wine to share communion. So they acted it out. The body of Christ is broken for you. The body of Christ is broken for you. blood of Christ is shed for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. And in that proclamation of that deeper truth, the reality that his sacrifice, his body, his blood is present when we are gathered together in his name and called according to his purpose and they acted out communion and their faith and their proclamation of body and blood without bread and cup led others in that prison to say I want that faith I want that so we've heard on the night in which he gave himself up for us he took bread gave thanks to you God broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me Notice at the very beginning of these words, it's he serving, Jesus serving. I wish maybe we would start just calling it the Lord's Supper. And the reason why is the Lord does the serving. When we are gathered together and we participate in Holy Communion, the Lord is the one doing the serving. The Lord is the one doing the work. We are participating in it and allowing him to share with us his life again even if the plate is empty and the cup is not full. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you, God, and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, he said. From the earliest days of the church, we see in Paul's letter to his friends in Corinth, they use these words. Over and over, they reminded one another about what's important. And we say, though, in thanks to God, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. You know it. You know this. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In remembrance of these, your mighty acts, God, we do this. In Jesus Christ, in Christ, we find our purpose, we find our mission, and our very identity in Christ. And we offer ourselves to you in return. And this holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us. Notice these words that we share. We call them the words of institution. But I want you to hear them less about the bread and the wine. Now these are important symbols. And they are important that we would never want to do anything to take them for granted. But hear the words of institution differently. Maybe hear them as they are meant. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood the parts that I want to talk about are the first word and the last word pour out your Holy Spirit on us on you gathered now that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood By your spirit, God, make us one with Christ. One with each other and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes again in final victory. And we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Do you hear? Do you hear what's being said here? This is important, but even in its absence, what's more true is that God's Holy Spirit has been poured out on you, on all of us. The Holy Spirit proves that the church is not this. Holy Spirit has proved that the church is now deployed in the world, going and serving in the world as the body of Christ. We are now redeemed by his blood, knowing who we are in Christ. To be made one in Christ means that we are made one with each other, one in ministry to the whole world. And until he comes again to claim his own, and until he comes again to drink that cup with us, he's refraining from it until he comes again and until we're at the banquet table together. Make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry in the world. Holy communion is offered when we are together in love. But what do we do when we're not together but we're still in love? Have you ever heard of the love feast? Have you ever heard of the agape feast? Have you heard of the Moravians? In the early 1700s, John Wesley and his brother got on a boat to come to America to save the savages. And on his way over, he thought he was coming to serve God. But storms came and almost knocked that ship under. And after the third storm came and the waves broke the main sail, He was crying, and the other Church of England um, missionaries were crying, oh God, we're going to die. And he looked over, and there were a group of Moravians, German Christians, pious people, and they were singing praises. 
celebrating their life with God, fully trusting. And somehow that changed Wesley and said, I want that. I need that in my life. And he became close friends with the Moravians and Zinzendorf and all the other leaders while he was there in the colonies and even after he came back. These Moravians left a huge mark on what we call the Wesleyan tradition and the Methodist church. And one of the things that they would do often is they would share a love feast instead of, or in addition to Holy Communion. They would get together for a a feast of food. But what they would do is they would take sweet coffee, very sweet coffee, and they would take sweet rolls and sweet bread And they would pass them to one another. They would break the bread and give it to one another. And they would sing a song. And they would read a scripture. And they would proclaim what God has done in their lives. And how how reconciliation has changed them. And if there was any breach or division in them, they would go and reconcile to one another. So that they could be in love with one another. So they could follow Jesus' commandment to love one another. And they would practice this sign of love and reconciliation with one another. So I make an invitation to you. Until we can come together and celebrate this plate and cup together, I invite you right now. If you have family around you or if even you're single at home, grab someone over the phone, do a love feast with them. Because what you're doing is practicing the afikamen when you do. Remember the afikamen, the wafer, the dessert, the thing that comes at the end? The love feast is the practicing of the love of God in Christ. And that may just be the more important thing that we do right now. So go and get a cookie. And go and get some kind of drink. And sit down together and sing a simple song read a scripture passage, and do this. Tell them that you see Christ in them and tell them how you see Christ in them. And if there's a breach in brokenness, attempt to reach out and say, when we come back together, I want us to come back together fully reconciled in Christ. That's our invitation tonight. That is what this is all about. This Monday Thursday. It's not about coming and eating this bread and drinking from this cup. It is more about serving and washing feet. It is about finding a new plate and a new cup representing the commandment to love one another. Because we're going to that cross after Jesus. He said we can't go with him. He has to do it. We'll come later. You see, his cross becomes our cross. His death becomes our death. Because his resurrection becomes ours. This is the commandment to love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him will not perish. He's washed their feet and said, you have to do it too. He's fed them with his body. He's given them a new commandment and a new covenant to go along with it. He's told us to love one another, to feast with one another, to share the afikamen dessert with one another, the sweetness of love with one another. This is the mandatum. This is the monday, Thursday. This is the commandment. Wash. Eat together. sacrifice for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life this is God's act of reconciliation this is in Christ who we are too washing eating sacrificing following oh God if there's any other way oh Father let this cup pass from me there is no other way you have to drink the cup not my will Father 
but your will be done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life.